Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bernie Glenn. And they're racing. Yeah, and for And Gallen. they're off and running. There we go. Down now, the stretch now, they come. Now, you got to wonder, why are we talking like that? Well, there's a reason. We have a special guest, Sam Spear, who is a horse racing expert on. Why? Because the Preakness is, Preakness coming, is coming up. And yeah. then the yeah. long one, the Belmont Stakes. Yeah, I know yeah. a little bit about horse racing. Okay. Sam, yeah. welcome to Sports Econ 101. Uh, happy to be with you. Okay, I, I, I got to ask a quick question on this Kentucky Derby, okay? When I was a kid, I remember that the best bet to make, and I guess you could do it on the Preakness and the Belmont Stakes, is betting on, quote, the field, which are like the 15 of the worst horses, and you bet them to show, and that's usually a good bet. But I couldn't figure out which, which uh, yeah, you know, well, I, I couldn't figure out which horses were in the field this time. But Sam bet on the California Chrome. Oh, we, we don't have the field anymore because we have 20 horses, yeah. so everyone gets a slot. That's but, why I couldn't uh, find it. the field used to be good because uh, they used to run more than 20, mm. so uh, you just took uh, you know the, the the highest odds. Yep. The, the, the horses that were put in the field usually went off at high odds. Hey, i got to ask you, how did that little horse win? I mean, I, we heard he was the favorite. We heard that it was a great story. The owner celebrated his 61st birthday the day he won. But, you know, he was... I believe it's the oldest trainer, too. Yeah, with 77? 77? Yeah. 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 But that little horse, he was just a little... Man, he was tough. He was tough down the stretch. Well, he pulled away. the most royalty-bred horse of all time. But as you know, we just finished the NFL draft. There'll be players making the NFL teams that were not drafted. Uh, uh, Mike Piazza was, uh, I think, uh, 250th, yep. uh, only because he knew, uh, sort of knew his father. That's right. So there are people uh, and there are horses uh, that are overlooked, but this definitely was coming from uh, the mayor cost $8,000. They bred it to a sire for 2500 at Harris Farms. And here, with 10-5 invested, they win the Kentucky Derby. That's amazing. And they, along the way, they turned down, uh, for 49% of the horse, they turned down uh, $6 million. Wow. I always looked at the hind quarters of a horse and bet on that, figuring mm. that's where the legs come in. Right. Well, uh, it's important to have uh, the, the rear end of the engine <laughs> and the, the power that you need. But, uh, this horse has been well-trained, uh, conditioned by our chairman, a veteran, Jockey, former jockey and trainer, and uh, not a former trainer anymore, but he had cut back in the amount of horses he was training in 77. And to uh, come up with this uh, horse, he's done a great job because he gave him a nice foundation racing seven times as a three year old. So he went into his three year old campaign and running the preps for the Kentucky Derby, well conditioned, and then he started winning uh, these races. And uh, very impressive style each time as he did in the Kentucky Derby when he opened up in the stretch and had a five-length lead. Well, all of these co all these horses, these, these colts, they need to have a, a driver, and in this case, a rider. How much of a difference, I don't know whether it's furlongs, links, whatever, how much of a difference is it between a good jockey and a great jockey? Well, all things being equal, uh, you want the best manager, the best coach, the best jockey. They, they can be the 5% that you need, but you definitely have to have the players, the horses, and they say you need the horses. But in this case, Victor Espinosa uh, picked up the horse, and he won his, he began the streak we're on right now of five in a row. They haven't lost since he become the jockey. Now, Victor started his career at Bay Meadows and Golden Gate Fields. He was apprentice, uh, the leading apprentice rider here and finished second to Russell Bays a couple of times before he took his tack down south. And uh, Art Sherman uh, had a period there about six straight years of finishing second to Jerry Hollendorf as a trainer before he went down south. And, and so uh, it's important to have a very good jockey. Now, uh, Victor also was familiar with uh, Churchill Downs. He had won the Derby uh, on War Emblem back in 2002. So experience for that racetrack was important. He seems to fit this, uh, this horse very well. And going into the race, I wanted him to break uh, well, but not break on the lead. Sit right off the early pace. Don't get in any trouble. Then make your move around the half mile pole. Put yourself in position. And then turn for home. Take off and open up. And that's exactly what happened yep. in the field of 20. Uh, we'll only have, we will only have, I say, a field of 9 or 10 in the, in the Preakness. And what are, what are his odds for uh, winning the Preakness? 
Well, tomorrow they will draw post position and they will lay the money line, but I think that he'll be uh, uh, he'll be uh, a prohibited favorite. He, he'll be, uh, I think, he'll be like four to five or three to five. Now, Sam, tell us why the Belmont is always the. You know, you, you see so many horses win the first two. I was lucky it's enough. The longest, it's the longest. Well, I, you know, I, I, it's not just the longest, but there's there's more to it than that. It's it's the pressure. But I get, I'm curious to get your thoughts about because I'm not a horse racing expert, but I was lucky enough to cover the entire Triple Crown of horse racing when I worked in New York one year, 1981, when Pleasant Colony won the first two legs and then got to the Belmont. And I remember walking down to the paddock area with the rest of the media, and the horse was all he had this this coat of uh, sweat. And everybody says, oh, he's washy. Something's wrong with that horse. And, of course, he did not finish even close to the front of the pack. And I'm wondering why, you know, Edward mentioned that it's a longer race, but it's more than that, isn't it? Yeah, it is more than that, but the distance is important because, you see, uh, for whatever reason, uh, the athletes of today, uh, you don't, they don't box 15 rounds anymore. They don't go nine innings. And we're not training horses to go a distance to ground as much. We're training more. We're breeding more for speed. So we're running five and a half furlongs, five furlongs, six furlongs. To, to win a cross-country race, as opposed to a 100-yard dash, as you know, you, you don't run real hard at the beginning. You pace yourself and have that big kick at the end. Well, for most of these horses, they haven't been bred to cover that distance, that mile and a half. So after they go a mile, some of them hit the wall. And, and uh, Sam, if, if the field is you know, a lot muddier than normal, wouldn't that change quite a bit so that maybe you start looking well, at the Well, I'm not sure what the weather's going to be on Saturday in Baltimore. I know it rained in the East Coast earlier this week. It rained uh, the week before the Kentucky Derby. But by the time they, they get it, it must have rained that day, you know, that afternoon. Like, it rained an hour before the race uh, for Smarty Jones. Before, before uh, that happens, they'll have that track uh, nice and fast. And so you'll, um, you'll have will should have a fast track. Now, if it was to be sloppy, meaning that there was water on top of the track, that would favor uh, speed, and that uh, shouldn't hurt uh, uh, California Chrome at all. Because hey. what you want to do is get out on the lead and kick the mud back in the face of the horses who are On the subject of California Chrome, I was doing the highlights that day of the Kentucky Derby on the TV side, and, and, and as I was voicing over the highlights, I, I was thinking, and then I later said on the air, I said, boy, Man, all of these Kentucky Derbys, I don't know, what, 170 some? What, uh, only four California bred have won the whole thing, mm -hmm. with California Chrome wow. being the first one, get this, since, what, 1962? Is that right? Yeah, yeah there's been 140 Kentucky Derbys. Okay, there you go. This was the fourth one, the first one since 1962. Well, why? And, uh, it's because they're all at the well, beach. Because the, <laughs> what you do is you, you have to have best mares, and the best mares are in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. You breed... Uh, you try to breed the best of the best. So Kentucky is known as the bluegrass country. Kentucky is where they produce most of the uh, champions. Now there are horses that won from New York and Florida and Virginia and uh, Maryland, but the majority of them come from Kentucky. That's where the best mares are, and that's where they bring the sires to, to mate. So that's what it's been. So this is a tremendous boost for California racing to have a cowbred win. It might encourage uh, people to get in the business owning a cowbred because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of bonus money if you are a cowbred we have a lot of races strictly for cowbreds and so there's like 30 million well, 16 million dollars extra in purses mm -hmm. and 14 million dollars extra in breeding meaning being the uh, stallion uh, and the owner and the breeder so there's a lot of incentive to own a cowbred but it was important to have somebody win so that you can remind people uh, it pays to be a cowbred great and Sam Spear Horse racing expert. Thank he you is. so much he for is. joining us. Hey, Sam, in the studio. great insights, man. Yeah, that's yeah. good stuff, and Sam's been around this okay. area forever. Hey, tell you what, why don't you listen to this uh, trivia question, okay? The uh, theme is Horse Racing's Triple Crown. Oh, okay. Here's our first question. And actually, these are pretty Sam will know the answer. Yeah, yeah, don't, yeah, don't bark it out, Sam. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah okay. exactly. Keep it quiet. Okay, yeah. in 1978, Affirmed won the Triple Crown. Which horse came in second in all yeah. three races? The first three emails with the correct answer win a free three-day, two-night stay at the Lighthouse Resort, which, by the way, I did pick the trifecta in the race. Did you? Okay. Yeah. 
The first three, uh, okay, so email edward at sportsecon101.com to answer this question. In 1978, a firm won the Triple Crown. Which horse came in second in all three races? Don't touch that dial. Sports Econ 101 will be right back with a very interesting cyclist. Aladar. Aladar. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Firm yeah. Aladar. Who came in third? Oh. I believe it. I do not know. You remember, you remember Sam, you still with us? I do. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Hey Sam, that that was real good. I mean, I could have, man, I, I I could go on and on with Sam. By the way, the jockey was Steve Coffin. Steve Coffin, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What's he doing these days, Sam? Steve Coffin, he won the Triple Crown. What's he doing these days? And later he went to California, right? And he lost 110 straight races. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he kind of kind of died. He was a million dollar man at winning all the races there wow. back east. So he was getting too heavy to be a jockey here in the states. Got a big offer to go to England uh, and Europe and ride for Robert Sankster, and he paid him a, a huge amount of money to be his personal jockey. Wow. So he went over to England. So when I first interviewed him, uh, he, he had a, a Kentucky accent, being uh, born and raised in Kentucky. And then the second time I interviewed him, he was traveling on an all star team of jockeys for the International Jockey Competition. He had a British accent. Well, wow. and then the last time uh, we chatted, he was back home running a farm. Kentucky. He had regained his Kentucky accent. Ah, oh, I see. Funny. I see. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Sam, now, 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 how many? Now, let's see. We got. We had a firm in '78. We had. No, 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 no. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. Because I got some more. I got some more. I got some I'm just trying to. Questions. I'm just trying to think of the Triple Crown winners of my lifetime. Second, right? second period. Oh, no, 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 yeah, because I want to. No, I do have a question. No, 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 don't, don't say it. Don't say it because I do have one in 1977. Okay, because okay. the fact is, in the 70s, we had three triple crowns. Yeah. Three, okay. Exactly. Oh, yeah. okay. We haven't had any since. Oh, yeah. Okay. That so, was a great era was. Uh, to have three uh, champions in, 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 in a decade and then not have one since then. Yeah, mm. amazing. Sam, thank but you, you know, so much for joining us. To other sports, it, it, it's not that easy. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, Sam. Okay, so right. I, 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 I look forward to seeing you at the race. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, hey, I'll, I'll yeah. see you sooner than later, Sam. Okay. Take, take care, right. Sam. It's good talking to you. Thank you. All right, man. Okay. Good guy. Yeah. Very good Very guy. Very nice guy, too. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So let me get... Um, at the racing Okay. At the station. All right, so... Okay. Bruce, I'm going to give okay. you this. Oh, am I sliding over? Um, yeah, what, yeah. That's a good way of doing it. Right, there we go. Now, and if you want to slide over here so that the camera can see on there, too, that would be great. Is it a main focus uh, uh, of the Garden of the Sahara, or maybe the Garden of the Last Expedition in California? Well, I was thinking the Sahara. You know, it's almost too bad that camera couldn't fit right here, because through the glass, you'd be able to get almost right. everybody. But through the reflection. Are you going to have to redo this? Okay. No, it's it's on. It's on. Oh. It's, it's just the I just got to turn this one on. In, in the way. Yeah. Yeah. Is he off? Yeah. This will turn him on. Do I need to turn him on? Switch. Wait a minute. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. There he is. Okay. There he is. All right. We're good. We're good. We're good. All right. We're good. We're good. And if for some reason it, it shorts out again, you just have to kind of hold it. No, I'll definitely let you hold it. And it's all about the pelvis. Yeah. Does he need Does he need these? Yes. Here. Thank you. There you go. It always makes life easier. All right. right, so we'll come back with the trivia question, and okay. we'll uh, introduce... Oh, do I need to clap twice again? Yeah, got to have you just touch. Um, should, should I do my... Uh, Tell me when you're ready. Okay. What's that Spanish dancing? Is that speed? We didn't yeah, get it. Here. Yeah, because you can... The good. Spanish dancing is real popular. The uh, yeah, there you thing. go. Flamenco. 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 There. There you go. He's gonna do All right. Fandango. Fandango. That's a movie. That's a Castaneda. That's the Castaneda. That's okay. the Castaneda. That's right. Okay. Here we go. I do. Oh, good. Okay. Here we go. 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 Here we we went to the first commercial break. We asked this trivia question again. The theme was horse racing's triple crown. 
1978, a bird won the Triple Crown. Which horse came in second in all three races? Rosie? Rosie? It was Aladar. Aladar. Yeah, Aladar. Can you imagine coming in second? <laughs> well, oh, hey, I wonder if there's been a horse that's won second place in all three races. Well, what about, jeez, uh, let me think here. Don't, don't uh, say it. That may be one of our trivia questions. <laughs> <laughs> The next trivia question. The next trivia question. Well, what, was, what was the movie that just came out last Secretary. Probably... Yeah. Secretary. Yeah, yeah. was it? Sea uh... Yeah. Secretary. No, no, no. Sea <laughs> way back in yeah. the 50s. Yeah. Or 40s. The, what's no, what's yeah. the one with Diane Lane? Sea Biscuit. Sea Biscuit. Yeah. That's... No, no, no. Secretariat. Secretariat. No, no, that's Secretariat. That's Secretariat, Secretariat was, yeah. was 37. Lane. You know, Secretariat died at the age of something like 32, and they did a uh, autopsy. autopsy. His heart was, was like, like twice. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of huge hearts, this guy, our next guest. Okay, so we, we this is an odd, an odd show, an interesting show, because we have a second guest. Usually we only have one, but we have to have Reza on here. And Reza's last name is Takraban, right? Did yes. I say that right? Very, Very good. good. Okay. Now, Reza is a cyclist, but he's not just any cyclist. This guy raced across the Sahara Desert. Not what? on a camel. Are you but crazy? On a bicycle. What? Is that what your mom asks you? Are you crazy? Yeah, I get it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> what, like fourteen hundred miles or something? How many? How many gallons of water did you have on your back? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I found on a grill. Wow. <laughs> okay. Now, but before we get into this, like, you know, you kind of a special suit or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure coolant. I'm sure people are looking and going, okay, well, you know, if you have one thing, what would it be? Like, you know, canteen or maybe a, a white covering to cover the sun. Me, I would have a Chevy car door. Because when it gets hot, I'd roll down the window. That's right. Okay, so tell us about training and going across the Sahara Desert. Well, uh, the idea came up, um, came about when I was in Nepal and uh, was cycling. And, uh, but when I get back to England, I decided to develop this idea. And uh, we had a very cold winter in England uh, in 2011. I remember uh, the temperature was uh, hovering around 30 degrees. And uh, it, was, it was quite a cold time for training. And the Sahara Desert was 115 degrees, so <laughs> you can imagine the, the, the difference. Um, I had to get a uh, bit of a science behind the ambition and got a university on board, uh, the University of Westminster uh, Sports Medicine Department. They actually created the Sahara condition. Wow. And uh, they put me into that climate. So I was, I was training uh, partially uh, that climate to just get ready for the to basically survive on, uh, on a bicycle in, in Sahara, 12 hours of cycling a day, which involves a lot of pushing, and uh, you lose a significant amount of fluid. Sure. Um, so you, you've got to be sort of accustomed to that, that sort of climate. Yeah, how much water weight do you lose when you train like that? Uh, a day. Water do I lose? Do I, what do you mean? When you sweat, you sweat that water weight yeah. out. I mean, uh, well, I, I, I take about uh, nine liters of water. Wow. Away. <laughs> <laughs> that's like that's like two gallons, two plus gallons. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Whew, that's amazing. I, I saw the video. He's got a video. What, what, just really quickly, uh, if people wanted to check you out, what, what is the video? Yeah, it's uh, www.cyclingsahara.com. You go to the media uh, tab, and uh, there is a BBC documentary made of the trip yeah. uh, called "The Man Who Cycled the Sahara." Uh, it's on the top of the page, and then there's a. And, and Anybody I, I, try I, I, and I, talk I, you out of it? This <laughs> is insurance, man. <laughs> How about, are you married, Raja? Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, I was going to say, oh, well, yeah, 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 exactly. Actually, uh, talking about insurance, I was working for an insurance company. Uh, uh, I went to get a kidnap and ransom insurance, and uh, not so that <laughs> one single insurance company wanted insurance oh, no. because of the danger involved. Of course, yeah. But, but here's the thing is that, well, the thing is that, um, you didn't just go straight through because of there were some dangerous conditions. You had to kind of ride around. You actually had to go to South Africa to come around. Yeah. <laughs> no, I had to. Um, I, it was a Guinness World Record attempt, so I had to do it. Uh, negotiate it into the two legs. So the first leg was done in uh, Algeria, and the second leg was done in Sudan. Wow. Um, and I have to just go around the danger zone because um, just before I got there, uh, the Al Qaeda Maghreb, uh, it's an Al Qaeda branch that's working. Um, operating in North, you know, North Africa, and it's a, they take over the, the area in Niger. They, they kidnap some French mine workers. 
um, a British uh, engineer got his head chopped off, and it was very, very difficult uh, situation for me to just go there. Like it was quite dangerous. You, you couldn't just say time out. I got to go through this desert <laughs> and then yeah. continue on with your operation. Guys, yeah, just settle yeah. through and just <laughs> hold your fire. Bad yeah, enough to have to go okay. through a desert and have somebody, you know, with a machete saying, "I'm going to chop you." Yeah, you're yeah. 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 you go Because you're an invalid. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, wow. this, this guy though, this, this, guy's, this guy was a really good athlete though. He, he played a lot of basketball, right? Uh, yes, before. I did. I was uh, once at the age of 24. I was playing uh, semi professional basketball, but uh, you know, I decided to just put it aside and join in with uh, rat racing, join the financial industry. And you know, 10 years later, I just realized that I was just missing the athlete life mm-hmm. that I always wanted to do as a kid, as being a sort of an adventurer. And I started doing sort of starting from micro adventure and just sort of build it up to the Okay, so if I go to the gym and I have my, let's say, iPad with me and I click on your video, can I, can I ride the bike and watch your video and get sort of like the same, <laughs> same rush? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean to make light of it because it, it, it's awesome. Yeah. You know, I, the only reason I'm teasing like this is because I, I, my jaw dropped when I saw the video and I see him pushing the bike through sandstorms, you know, yeah. just like you would imagine. Yeah. You know, and it's like you can't just... Because it, the thing is, that when everyone thinks about the Sahara Desert, you think about riding on sand. It's not exactly like that all the time. It, it kind of looks like Mars, doesn't it? I mean, it really does. It Those does. pictures that you see of Mars that are that are transmitted thousands of miles, it's what the Sahara Desert looks like. Exactly. It's, it's just surreal. It's an unlimited horizon. It's just like, it's infinite. There's like infinite amount of sand and nothing. That, that must have make you feel good, though, about having the, you had a driver yeah. who stayed how far back from you? Uh, miles no, he was he was having his own schedule. So the, we were supposed to meet every twenty miles, uh, but he was he was a tribal man, so he didn't have any good idea of the miles and kilometers. So um, sometimes that happened to be fifty miles, sometimes that happened to be seen by ten miles. Um, so he was sort of touch and go, but I, I needed to have him as a um, backup and support because it would be impossible to carry of that course. amount of food. Well, well, if you would have just had a tow rope. And put in new, had him put in neutral. You could have towed him the whole way, and then you wouldn't have lost him at all. <laughs> no, but uh, well, I mean, it was very essential to have him on board of because he's the he's, he's part of a Tuareg tribe, and Tuareg people are people that actually belong to that desert and they live there. And surviving in that condition, I mean, if you are very good, probably you can do it. But an office worker like me, just getting yeah. out there and experiencing that situation, it was all about survival. And having him on board, he was the man that actually taught me just how to survive in a, in a, in a tribal manner. I mean, for example, the one thing that I didn't know is like having very sweet, it's something that actually allow you to uh, overcome your dehydration. That's that's how that's how they survive. They sweet tea, sweet, sweet tea. tea. Yeah, yeah. They, they well. drink lots of sweet tea. They drink lots of mint. I'm just wondering the mental part, you know. But I, I mean, I, I'd be scared to death to even start this thing, and just realizing that. And you can't just stop halfway through and then go, eh, I'm done with this, I want to go home. <laughs> I mean, how do, you, how do you overcome that mental part? Well, a lot of it, just getting to the starting point is 70% of the attempt, is 70% of the effort. You've got to do so much to, you know, by the time you get, it's, it's, it's not only the physical training, it's also mental, it's also um, getting sponsorship in place, um, getting all the logistic plan, how do you trust the guy in the Sahara Desert to just, you know, for a fair storm, I'll meet you meet this guy, and he's supposed to uh, be with you for the next Good few point. days. Um, and what does it actually take to siphon the Sahara Desert? So by the time you get to the starting point, you should have answered all those questions. Yeah. So the fact that a sandstorm coming in front of you, or other obstacles, or uh, you know, getting your latitude wrong, and you have to uh, you know, cycle through the sand dunes, and uh, carry your bicycle, that sort of thing really shouldn't break you down because you have to do your homework uh, before properly. Before yeah, how much there. did you have to pay that guy to follow you? Basically? Actually very small amounts in his packs. Twenty dollars a day. Wow. But that's a lot of money for those people. Yeah. 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 What was the communication setup like? Oh that's that's a very interesting point. Um, he was speaking a tiny bit of French and Arabic and uh, Berber, which is the language of those sort of people in uh, North Africa. And my command of all these three languages was absolutely zero. So somehow we managed to communicate. At uh, the beginning it was very difficult, but uh, we somewhat sound the same language and we started understanding each other. So it, it was a great man. Now you're, you're, nighttime you have a flare coming. <laughs> I was going to say, Raz is from 
Iran originally, but yeah. you're a British subject. So you yeah. lived in Iran and England, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. The language is good. The, the, it's good Farsi, so yeah. maybe it's the Italian. Yeah, well. Good point. Tell you what, we're going to cut to our uh, second commercial break here. Stay, stay with us for a while. We got, I'm sure we got a few questions to ask you here. Like, what do you eat out there in the desert? Yeah, yeah, yeah besides the scorpions <laughs> and mezcal. <laughs> One of those little uh, creepy, crawly, uh, you know, lizards or something. I'd say witchetty grubs, but that's an Australian yeah. film. Okay, here's the second commercial break trivia question. Again, the theme is horse racing triple crown. Before Secretariat in 1973, you had to go back 25 years to find the last tri triple crown winner. Which horse won the triple crown in 1948? The first three emails with the correct answer win a free three day, two night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Email edward at sportecon101.com. The answer to this question before Secretariat in 1973, you had to go back 25 years to find the last Triple Crown winner. Which horse won the Triple Crown in 1948? Mm -hmm. And uh, when we come back, we're going to ask more questions of Reza Akraban. Hey, my Farsi's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. We're going to ask you some more questions about cycling and uh, about uh, the Sahara Desert and, and what's your next adventure, okay? Sure. Don't touch that dial. Sports Econ 101 will be right back. I was going to say War Admiral. That's what, that was my guess. Yeah. But that, you know, that could be. Or is that even further back? back? Uh, I think it's probably because it's right after World War II. No looking it up on the internet. No. Uh, we, I, were I flush, we were flushing the, uh, the aftermath of World War II. I grew up as a kid. My dad was a fighter pilot during the war. So, yeah, over in, in Japan. So, as a kid growing up in the 50s and early 60s, uh, you know, those guys that fought that war, now all of them are gone. They were our, you know, dads, and they were our heroes. So, it, and then when we when we got off and into the mess of Vietnam, that changed everything. It was like, you know, I know these guys instead of coming up like heroes, people got spit on and stuff. Well, you know, unfortunately, it was a bad, it was a bad, it was fought under false pretenses. We went over there and yeah. killed a million people and had fifty eight thousand. I mean, it's just you know, like most wars, they're. I heard it's a, in a, with the Korean War, people didn't even really like to know what it was. What yeah. it was happen. In fact, my father in law was on. Pork chop hill. Oh, yeah. geez. oh, that's brutal. That was really brutal. Do, do you, here's a little fun like, statistic. Um, how many bullets per person were used per kill? So basically, take how many bullets were used? Probably about by 40 or 50. 50,000 bullets wow. per person. Wow. So, you so, yeah, wow. that, so there's a lot of. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you wow. shoot enough out there, you're going to hit some eventually. <laughs> Is 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 May twenty seventh a Thursday? May twenty seventh uh, was a Tuesday. Tuesday. It's a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. right. May twenty seventh is a Tuesday. Yeah. I, I have I have three prospective dates to be a ball dude at the Giants. Oh nice! Oh. I can do a Tuesday the twenty seventh. I can do the day game Wednesday the twenty eighth. Do the day game. Or I could do yeah, the day game. Yeah, I like the day game. Yeah, the day game is more fun. Does that mean when, when foul ball comes? You I've done it. I've done it before. Oh man! Yeah, yeah I always want to be like. Did, you see that video? You saw the video, right? The, the girl. Uh, it, it's a it's like a DV or something, and it's a foul ball in left field. And the, the left fielder is like he knows he can't get to it, so he doesn't do it. The ball girl jumps up with her left foot. Oh, on the, scales it! Scales and they it! it and yeah, I mean, the amazing. Time, it's just amazing. Just incredible. I mean, in fact, at first, I think it. I think the thought was that it was doctored. It's but, just uh, seen yeah. like it, but uh, boy. That was a fun game last night. I was out there, and uh, Tim Lincecum looked like vintage Tim Lincecum. Yeah. Wow. This new guy they brought in, he, his first hit is a giant home run, second hit. It was under the bay, and the second one drove in two runs and broke up the tie. It's amazing. I love that story. Yeah. But uh, great about baseball. Yeah, 30, 36, 10 strikeout games. Like yeah, that. I know. Yeah. And he always does it to the Braves. He had 14 against them in the uh, playoffs a couple years ago. Yeah, Braves are a bitch. Yeah, they are. <laughs> That's yeah. true. So your this will be your Mr. Involvement. Have yeah, there's there's a on YouTube, YouTube there's a Mr. Involvement ball dude. Is there? On the, yeah, yeah, and, and Kruka, they just he was just merciless. Oh uh, because I went to field a couple and one, you know, got me off the Ooh. chin and just yeah. did that. Well, these balls coming down the line are, are fast. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, softball's one thing, baseball's another yeah. thing. Yeah. They get some shots down there. Yeah, these guys yeah, when they hit it hard, yeah. it's foul. Well, it's you know, it's either get out of the way or yeah. Yeah. You gotta, yeah, I wanna I wanna see you like die, you know. Get in the stands. Well, some of the old guys do that, and they take the frat balls, but it's great. I mean, just but it's the, it's the it's the pop ups in foul territory. They they tell you, you know, you get, get your stool and get the hell out of the way because <laughs> these guys, you know, they yeah. can make a play on it. That's right. Yeah. 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 It was uh, Kirk Gibson, I think, was playing third base, 
the umpire was just kind of watching him like this too, and he was just getting in the way. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Okay, you guys ready? Yep. No. Okay. No, not yet. Fun show. Yeah. Good stuff, oh, I didn't even see the second camera. Oh, I, I didn't oh. see that. Yeah. Oh, he's, hey, you, yeah, you got it covered. He is a professional. That's right. How about three okay, claps? Okay, give me two claps. Yeah. Give me three. I don't care. Oh, I like you. You're so good. I love you. <laughs> okay, here we go. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. We're having too much fun here. We got Vernon Glenn in the studio. We got Bruce McGowan in the studio. We have Razor Pacrabon in the studio. Okay, when we cut to the second commercial break, we ask this trivia question again. The theme is Horse Racing's Triple Crown. Before Secretary in 1973, you had to go back 25 years to find the last Triple Crown winner. Which horse won the Triple Crown in 1948? And both of you answered? Yeah, we said War Admiral. No, no. you remember War Admiral was with uh, Seabiscuit. Uh, oh, okay. All right, all right. So but you have heard of this horse. This isn't Seabiscuit. No, but what happens when the policeman pulls you over? You get a... Citation. 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 Okay. Citation. Citation. Ah, yes. Okay, now, we have in the studio, again, as I, I mentioned, we have Reza Pakravan, who's a cyclist who cycled across the Sahara Desert. And also cycled across the uh, desert in Chile, is it? No, I walked the desert oh. in Chile. You oh. walked the desert in Chile. Yeah, this oh. guy, Jeez. Patagonia Desert. Patagonia Desert. Wow. That's, and how long is that? Uh, it takes 30 days. Did you carry your bike with you, or uh, no, 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 just, 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 just walked? Yeah. Just walked. Dude walked. walked. What was that? Four or five hundred miles? Eight hundred miles <laughs> on his bare feet. You're doing twenty, <laughs> 20 miles <laughs> backwards and in a sack. That's right. right. Twenty miles a day. I, I backpacked twenty miles when I was twenty-two up in the Sierras one day, and I would, we had to take a break in the middle of the day and took a nap. Literally, I've never oh, been yeah. so tired. See, and, for, I don't know how you guys can do that. For me, it's the hundred-yard marathon. You know, not dash or <laughs> run. It's a marathon. You know, so I don't, I don't know how you guys can have that kind of endurance. My wife is like that. Well, I was, like I said, I was 22 years old. So, yeah. you know, that was 40 years ago. I have a two-part question. First of all, uh, you got to wear any, like, sunblocks, something like that, protect your skin when you're doing this. And then the second one is nutrition. I mean, I, 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 yeah. you have to eat something relatively healthy so your body can, like, feed off of that. As you go, I mean, because that the burgers at the big, big old burgers at the finish, you yeah. gotta get there. <laughs> you know? uh, that, that was the incentive yeah. for him to finish. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Actually, but, but if, if you get your hands on the burger, you'd be a lucky day because you, you need calories. Yeah. Like you need 6,000 calories a day, and burger wow. is a very good source of calorie, but obviously in the middle of the Sahara Desert, no. it's very difficult to get all of the burgers. So only I in a, a oh, camel burger. But oh, yeah, uh, only in a mirage. <laughs> 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 oh, I was relying yeah. on my ration packs. Yeah. yeah. Those ration packs give you a specific amount of calories, like one portion is about a thousand calories. So um, I, need, I need to have quite a few of them. Uh, after a while, I just realized that the, actually what the diet that um, uh, these guys and my guide have having in the, the Sahara Desert, his diet is just designed for that uh, climate. He's, he's having lots of couscous um, and some meats and veg. What is couscous? It's, like, um, it's, it's not a like a rice, but yeah, it's oh, okay. kind of a Sort of a grain, so these are wheat, uh, okay. and sort of very crushed, uh, very small pieces. Okay. And you pour it into hot water. Yeah, it's like a, it's like, it's like, like a risotto type. Oh, sure, sure, okay. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's sort of powdered. Yeah. And uh, that that was that was the key. I was I started uh, putting my ra uh, ration uh, ration packs away and started uh, raising his food, and he was, he was sharing his food because he had plenty of it. And does he? I was going to say that like the ration packs. Off, does he carry all the food for you? Yeah. Yeah, but didn't I see you have a backpack on? No, no backpack. Okay. You can't carry a backpack, uh, backpack twice. So okay, or, or just, just a water bottle? Water. Just, uh, that's it. Water. Now, when you're hiking, though, through the, the you know, through Chile, you, do you have a guy also in, in no, support? No, no, you're by yourself. Friend, yeah. Yeah. Now, good news there is you don't have any Al-Qaeda down in no, South America. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have to worry. But you do have some pretty interesting little critters out Mountain there. Mountain goats, yeah, right? Yeah. No, as, as well as lots of llamas mm -hmm. and uh, canacos and that sort of thing. Yeah. Love the animals out there. Beautiful, beautiful landscape. And it's right along the ocean too, isn't it? Part of it. Uh, uh, that's that. Or is that the western no, bridge? That's that's the western front. Okay. Um, south of Argentina, across to Chile, back to Argentina, wow. back over to that ridge and to Brazil. Wow. Yeah, and when you were cycling, though, I mean, but there weren't any uh, any any predatory animals you had to like look out for or whatever when you're 
Especially at night. No, or the Sierra Desert. You're asking about the I'm Sierra. talking about the Sierra, Sierra, Sierra. Oh, Scorpions or whatever. Yeah. No, Scorpions. Yeah, but not no other kind of creatures. Okay. Like only camels that survive. Yeah, who can yeah, exactly right. who can live in that, no. that environment? Did, did, you, did you get to a point where you just felt like I just want to give up? Um, not no 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 actually uh, being, uh, I had I had quite a tough time in, in the sandstorm. I, I hit really badly and you know I lost it. Times, but uh, actually, I always thought the worst thing I can do is give it up. You know, the radar pick up the sandstorm. I mean, did you see it come? It just all of a sudden, bam! It just appeared. It just appeared. Oh, oh, yeah. Wow! Really? Yeah, wow! Yeah, right. Wow! Yeah. I'm, yeah. Curious, I'm curious. I'm curious. So, uh, Reza, are you are you spiritual at all? Are you into meditation or anything? Because you know, focus and concentration is Wait, so important. Well, well I mean, I mean, seriously, <laughs> some of the best athletes I know are guys that that you know they get into the zone, so to speak, and they. They tap into something, and whether they're, you know, Buddhists or whether they're just practicing meditation. I don't know. I've heard stories about climbers that do this sort of thing. I mean, did you have any any of that, or are you just all business? You're gonna, you know, you can you prepared and you're ready to go. I'm I'm not special at all. Um, I was uh, getting to the zone is absolutely crucial. The, the first uh, 20 miles every day is basically is a challenge to get to that sort of a mindset and to that mentality to just carry on and get into that sort of consistency and um, get a rhythm. Once you get that rhythm, you can keep going. And then some stuff, I, I gotta think that there was good, there, there were times that you said I'm gonna just push, get extra miles in for today, and then ease up the next day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you start the, when the when the climate was good, when it, the, you were feeling good, you, you you can push yourself to the limit, and then you know, you get big miles under the naked conditions, and that's great. You, know, you just yeah. have to like kick back and slow down. What was the, let me ask one quick question before we go. Uh, what was the hottest that, that it got? Oh, wow. Man. It was dry heat, though. Go ahead. <laughs> You're in a sauna. I mean, literally, hey, that's you, a sauna bath. You, you said you had any radar, but I mean, it, 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 was there some kind of, a, I don't know, a, 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 a trip tick or, or a gauge or something like that so you knew how far you had gone, how much farther you had to go? I mean, did, did you have, you must have some sense of, of how much ground you're covering yeah, per day. Yeah, I had, a, I had a, a trip computer as well as a GPS. Mm -hmm. uh, the GPS would tell me. You at least have earphones to listen to music or oh, something. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's crucial. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, but after a while, because you know, the one one of the big challenge uh, in crossing the Sahara was, I'm com I was working in the financial industry and you know having a five screen in front of me. You have your mobile phone. You have all this medium that is around you and mm -hmm. uh, constantly feeding you with information. And it just within ten days you end up in Sahara and there's nothing there. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the only thing you can you can do is just listen to music. After a while, that sort of a tranquility of, of the Sahara just yeah. put me in sort of such an amazing mood that I didn't even need to listen to it. What is your next uh, adventure, or where is it going to be? Well, I just got back from a big one, so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm planning the next one. Where, where is that going to be? Uh, I'm thinking of, um, I, I'm, I'm having three things in the radar. Uh, first is um, cycling a Trans-Amazonian Highway. Uh, north, north, uh, north part of South America. Uh, through the through the, through the Amazon, South, South right. America, that's right. correct. Yeah, through the Amazon, right. um, and from um, Ecuador uh, to to, to uh, Brazil uh, to from the source to to the Atlantic Ocean. Wow. Well, if you want to cross the Antarctica, I can hook you up. I know where that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How, yeah. How uh, far would be going through, through Brazil? Um, three and a half thousand miles. Ooh. Um, that's like going across America and plus five hundred more miles. Yeah, probably. You're gonna need a little wow. more gallon of water on that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, there's plenty of water. Yeah, out yeah. <laughs> Just watch out for those alligators. Yeah. 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 How so long I'm thinking about is um, crossing the Yukon River, uh, oh. and another one is actually rowing the Amazon. Mm. Well, that sounds like fun. I mean, you're a beast. <laughs> he's, he's seeing the world. The what, real, were the real world. What, what were your emotions when you were close to finishing? Yeah. I don't know if you saw the, the fit. I mean, what? My gosh, I. I, I you know, I can't even imagine what your thoughts were when you, you were. Yeah, hopefully it wasn't the mirage. <laughs> <laughs> what was there? What was there? Well, I have this image that, like, you know, in, in, a, in the finish line, there's lots of people standing and <laughs> cheering, and I have lots of cheerleaders, <laughs> and, um, you know, TV companies, you know, coming in, lots of camera flash and all of that. I mean, what actually. Yeah, the lady that kissed you at the top of the podium, like yeah. the tour of France. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, before I got there, just the uh, only thing that made me happy was, like, my GPS showing me. Latitude and 
18, and that's the end of the Saharan Desert, and that's it. It was me and this guy and a bunch of camels around. And, um, so that so, was so what's at the end of the Sahara Desert? The Sahara I mean, Desert. The Sahara I mean, Desert is located in two latitudes, which is N30 on the north, which is pretty much the same latitude as Cairo, and N18, which is the southern part of the Sahara Desert. But when you get... I mean, suddenly, are you in a bunch of cars and freeway, or I mean, you know what I mean? It's like, how do you? Where, where's the end of the Sahara? Well, this is going? a definition by Guinness World Record, but uh, okay. I think the way that they came up with this definition is that the change of the landscape. So yeah. the Sahara leads itself to the um, savanna, so that's where uh, you start seeing vegetation yeah, and exactly. life and yeah. water. Yeah, as soon as you saw that, we knew you were toward the end. Mm. Besides the shower. What's the first thing you did when it was over? <laughs> oh, um, gorge myself with uh, a massive amount of whiskey. Right, you didn't get right. sick. You didn't get sick, though. No, I didn't get sick in this, um, in this crossing the Sahara, but when I was cycling the uh, Africa, I got sick. Oh, uh, man. I got sick malaria. That oh. Did it rain during the Sahara Desert uh, ride? No. The long I mean, I don't know. I don't know. There have been in the Sahara Desert. Right? Never, I know it gets cold at night, doesn't it? Never rains. Never rains there. Okay, it does get cold at night, though, doesn't it? Very cold. Did you pull any female talent when you told them, hey, I just cycled across? <laughs> <laughs> All right. They probably didn't believe you. you, know? you they probably inside. said, that hey, Brad. So cool. <laughs> they probably said, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a good conversation starter. That's yeah, for sure. Yeah. Definitely. It, that's, just, that's just amazing. I mean, I look at it and I go, yeah, the guy's in good good shape, you know. And, you know, no, no six pack. Mm -hmm. I mean, no, no. Me, me, I've got a keg, you know. So I'm looking for the six pack and I'm going, yeah, okay, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll bike in this. Eh, no, I don't think so. Some, some of the best athletes, you know, we see it because we cover sports. Vernon and I, every day, competitive team sports. Some of the best athletes are the most innocuous looking guys. They look mm -hmm. like people yeah. who just stepped off the curb. And some of the best buffed guys are the biggest clumsy oaks that oh, you yeah. Yeah. Well, we used to. We had an you know? old gym team softball. Yeah. Oh, it's just embarrassing. They look good in the uniforms. Sure. But they played. I mean, they just couldn't, you know, couldn't move around. No. No. Yeah, hey, just for the, for, for the average mo listening or watching <laughs> out there, what's something that you could throw out that somebody could do every day cardiovascular-wise? Well, just cycle. Just get out there and cycle. It's, yeah. it's pretty good for you. Or, just or, run. or some kind of spinning stationary bike. Or, or swimming. Like that. Yeah. Swimming. No, I'm not a big fan yeah. of swimming myself. You've you got to spend lots of time swimming until you get a benefit but um, I, lo I love cycling you know it's, it's pretty good when, once just fresh air just get out there and um, sit on your bike did you get knees. sore though or have your knees hurt or your back hurt actually cycling is pretty good for both them for both knees and back make sure your seat's high enough right yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's a good thing I learned that the hard way yeah the only part I don't like about cycling is I hate to say this but right down there, it starts to hurt a yeah. little bit. Yeah, the chafing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. painful. You, just, you, know, you have to stand up a little bit. Yeah, I, I, like to, I like to body surf, and that to me is, I was out in the water yesterday, it was the best. I, I'm so relaxed after that. Good shape. Well, for his birthday. birthday. Yeah, for my birthday. Uh, yeah, yeah. Happy birthday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. you gotta do it, man. Well, Reza Pakravan, thank you so much for joining us. Again, give us your uh, website one more time so people want to obviously watch you do the Sahara Desert. www.cyclingsahara.com and you go to the media tab and it's not your tube there. Very Gotta get you in the National Geographic. That's what we're yeah. talking about. Yeah, well, that's what I'm here for, actually. Yeah, I had a documentary yeah. of my last trip. And it's on the National Geographic TV channel? Uh, no, I, I, I was interviewed by National Geographic, no. uh, National Geographic Radio, but uh, I have a documentary now in my hand that I'm just trying to get it to them, but I find it quite difficult to find it editor. Uh, uh, National Geographic. This is Sports Econ 101. It's all part of the great <laughs> That's it. Okay, theme of life. Cut to our third and final commercial break. Again, the theme is Horse Racing Triple Crown. In 1977 and 1978 were the only two consecutive years for Triple Crown winners. Now, we already talked about 1978 was a firm. Who won the Triple Crown in 1977? Uh, that's too easy. Okay. The first three emails with the correct answer in a free three day, two night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Email edward at sportsecon101.com. We answered this question. 1977 and 1978 were the only two consecutive years for Triple Crown winners. Who or which horse won it in 1977? Don't touch that dial. Sports Econ 101. We'll be right back with some closing comments. Good old Seattle Slew. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder what happened to that horse, too. <laughs> Probably died. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I, yeah, but I think he fathered. Uh, that was the one Steve Coffin had ridden, right? 
I'm not sure about that. I'm not. I'm not a big horse racing fan, but for some reason I remember those the '70s because those those horses were pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. See, Rez, Vern and I we cover. He's TV. I'm radio. I don't work full time anymore, but we cover the work, local teams. CBS local. Yeah. yeah, and I worked at the local sports station for about 18 years. So we cover all the the basketball, football, baseball, mm-hmm. and you know college, high school. I think when you do what he does, you have to cover everything. Yeah. When you do what I do, you more sort of specialize, specialize it in the major league, major college, because that's what the people listening to the radio want to hear. Like tomorrow, I have the Giants, but on Thursday, I'm doing a uh, doing a feature up in Nevada on a on a on a girl born with spina bifida or whatever how you pronounce spina it. Spina bifida. Thank you, spina yeah. bifida, and uh, she uh, she swims for uh, like a local. Oh, Swim team, cool. yeah, and wow. she, she's been doing it since she was like four wow. seven. So. That's great. Yeah, I, that was, that was, that was, you know, that the average sports yeah. fan loves those stories because they're human interest. It's mm-hmm. like what you're doing, you know, it's human interest. And then Friday is football, but yeah, yeah. I, I, I think we're on Raiders Friday. I, I tell you, they're going to be very yeah, interesting this year. Well, we grew up. Both of us grew up as sports fans. We we're, you know, I don't know about Vernon, but I wasn't a very good athlete. I was good enough to play high school ball at JV level. That's about it. But I love to talk and I love to, to watch sports. And my dad was a good athlete, mm-hmm. so I don't know about what your background. And I was, was just right? young, black, and fast. <laughs> <laughs> I was faster than the rest of the white kids. Wait, so young, fast. Yeah. What was the other one? Huh? Young, young, black, and fast. <laughs> yeah. Um, He's the quick little guy. Boom! <laughs> Scat back. Okay, we only have a quick minute and a half. So, um, any last? Uh, I mean, I've got a whole bunch of the stuff we'll have to cover next time. Yeah. Well, I. Think, uh, uh, Michael Sam, Sterling's trying to hang on to the cliffs. Mm. Um, oh, okay. okay, let's cover the Sterling because I was going to ask about Shelley Sterling and wanting to fight. Oh, God. Her. Mm-hmm. That's a whole. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about for a minute. See yeah. Donald digging himself a deep, deeper. Oh, yeah. God, that was embarrassing. When it went on with Anderson Cooper, that was yeah. embarrassing. Yeah. Michael, God, can't keep it, it was so it was so back. bad. Keep your mouth shut. So bad, Silver had to step in and apologize. Again, yeah. <laughs> man, that's, that's well, what bad. Why does he have to apologize to him, Silver? I mean, what because he he's the to... commissioner of the NBA, yeah, and, he and he's and here's an owner yeah. that's that's yeah. taking shots at that's one taking of the shots at, at one of the. Yeah, no, true, he's not, he's not it's Sterling's baby. And the thing was, no, but 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 at, at the first press conference, I don't know if you saw the first Sterling with the the first Silver press conference. Yeah. Within the first thirty seconds, he apologized to Magic Johnson yeah. uh, on behalf of the league. Because it was so embarrassing. Yeah. It was. You know? I, I hate to say it, 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 to a certain degree, Magic Johnson ought to be embarrassed for his behavior because he wouldn't have AIDS if he wasn't screwing around so much. But that's besides the point. Yeah. You don't bring that stuff up. That's yeah. between him and his girlfriends or whatever. That's his private business. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, you know. Ready? Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, uh, yeah. Hey, yeah. 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 Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Edward Brown, your host here, along with Vern Lentz, uh, Bruce McGowan. Ready to wrap it up. And our special other guest, Reza Akraban. Um, okay, now when we had to cut to the third commercial break, we asked a trivia question. 1977, 1978 were the only two consecutive years for Triple Crown winners. Which horse won it in 77? See, what city does Richard Sherman play in? That's, That's Seattle. it. Yeah. Seattle, Seattle Slough. Seattle Slough. That yeah. is correct. Yeah. Okay, uh, before we cut out of here, we had just want to bring up a quick thing. Shelly Sterling is fighting to keep her share of the Clippers, even though she hasn't divorced Donald yet. So, <laughs> yeah, but she's separated from him. Yeah. They don't live together, and she doesn't like him. Well, according to, according to Adam Silver, the bylaws of the NBA, if, if, you're, if your ownership is taken away uh, from you, if you're, vote, if you're voted out by the rest of the owners, that's it. Bet your, your, your relatives, kids, any, any of the partners that you have, silent, majority connected with that, or, or, or I or think just that's powerless. very smart because the, what would happen if she got it and then decided, okay, come on, Donald, we're gonna right. you know what, GM. Here's the thing: I think they're gonna take this to court and it's gonna be ugly and it's gonna drag on because there's no precedent for this. Well, yeah, because in, you know, then theoretically you have the, uh, you know, I would say the thought police gets all the PC stuff. Uh, what he said was he was an idiot. We yeah, all of agree course. on that. Yeah. But it's like, gosh, and now well, the one guy well, for the, the Dolphins, for, for uh, the Dolphins gets a Richie uh, Incognito. Yeah. You know, no, not that one. Um, the, Gets a, he gets fined for just the thing. Oh, for, for tweeting out what's yeah, up. Yeah, just saying, you know, awful. Yeah. Or but the thing, like, oh, the thing was, I, again, I'm taking devil's advocate position here. The thing was, this this conversation 
was supposed to be privately exactly, and it was released apparently by the woman's friend, Donald Sterling's oh, girlfriend's yeah, friend, yeah. Yeah. and that's illegal. Yeah. So you know? yeah, yeah, but in the in the NBA, you know, you don't need to go through the legal process to have your ownership taken away. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Fight, fight it in court all you want, but that's it. It's he, just, he will fight it in court. I guarantee. Oh, it. sure. Yeah. Well, it's just and, like baseball has, yeah. you know, antitrust. You know, the antitrust doesn't apply, yeah. apply to them. And not yeah. and not and not to change the subject. You yeah. mentioned Michael Sam. Let's praise the uh, the St. Louis Rams for, for, for taking Michael Sam in the seventh round. Yeah. Uh, boy, Coach Fisher, I mean, I, you, know, you knew what he was doing. Hey, we're going to take this be, guy. It'll be great. You know, let him play. Let him play football. That, that's that, what he that, that Rams defense is going to be tough next year. Okay, guys, we got to cut out. Here's our thoughts for the day. The most dangerous high school and college sport is? Lacrosse. Cheerleading. Oh, because of the. They get they're, more hurt there. They're thrown yeah. up in the air and exactly. do the flips. Fall yeah. up that pyramid. It's yeah. hurt. Yeah. It hurts time. And Australian rugby rugby player Ben Sislowski felt the need to get medical help when his four month headache was not going away. The doctor found an opponent's tooth in his forehead. Oh. Oh. That's using the old noggin. Oh, All right, tune in next week to Sports Econ 101. We'll be discussing sports from a business perspective and giving away more free vacations for answering sports trivia questions. Thanks for listening. On behalf of our team, I'm your host, Edward Brown. We'll see you next week. Good night, America. So long. We're just thinking about it. And then I